Hey everybody, welcome back to another daily drop here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones, and I'm not going solo today. I have a guest. I'm very excited. Our director of basketball recruiting and analyst, longtime AAU college and high school coach, Mr. David Sisk, who is on site running a basketball camp in Tennessee right now. So maybe the video might be a little spotty because everybody who has been in a high school and tried to use Wi-Fi knows how high school Wi-Fi usually is, even in the principal's office, which is where David is right now. David, we did a podcast, a recruiting one, uh, a little bit ago, and one of the topics that came up was about how some of the kids that are that are recruits now have a they look at rosters a little differently. They anticipate what might happen on rosters because of how fluid things are now. Something that kids really didn't talk about too much five, six years ago. So I thought it'd be good to have an isolated conversation on a drop about maybe where this is heading. And what I want to ask you is this: Might you see? more kids delay signing in November and wait till the spring to see what kind of activity is going on with different programs? Or is that real risky? Because a lot of coaches might say, hey, I'm going to take a 21-year-old who I've seen in college versus this 18, almost 19-year-old who I haven't seen in college. Yeah, uh, I think, the ones that you're going to see wait are uh, the ones who are good enough to be able to afford to do that. Like I'll give you an example. If you're AJ DeBanza, if you're Cole Pete, you're you're Caleb Wilson, you're any of those guys, I mean, you could name your spot. So you can wait. I mean, coaches would crawl all over each other to to get a kid like that. So you can, if you want to wait, you can wait. If you want to sign early, you can sign early. They're going to have a spot for you. And players like that, I don't think they're going to get pressured by coaches either. So, yeah, I think, like I said, I think it depends on the player. The more elite you are, uh, the more leverage, obviously, you have. And that's just life in general. Um, now, when you get into players – who are not, uh, maybe don't have that excess, do not have that type of advantage, I think two things happen. Number one, you can get, the way it's always been, a coach tells a player, hey, I got three spots here. The first one that signs gets it. You know, if you don't want to do it now, you're on a visit, you don't want to do it now, we got somebody else that'll want to do it. That's always happened, and we kind of were out on a limb about the recent transfer portal for the big, and we reported where other people were saying they were going to take two, and we were saying, well, from what we understand, they got three guys uh, from one big spot, the first one that takes it and have it, and uh, yeah. that's the case back with high school. Now, the new thing you run into those portals, this is what's made it different. And we first kind of got the indication of that when it first started happening. It was right while COVID was going on. And I think I've told this story before. I'm not maybe not on here, but I got a really good friend of mine whose son uh, was going to, uh, had been offered by school. And uh, he thought about, and it was Ole Miss. And uh, he thought about when Kermit Davis was there and so he, the dad called me, known him for years, and he'd asked me about that and just worried about the transfer portal and some things. Well, it so happened, uh, I, I called an, an individual in the coaching fraternity, and he called me back, and then I heard from one or two other coaches, and they were because news really spreads, and they were like, look, if he'll hold off, this was an ACC school, not North Carolina, and they said if he will hold off, this school is going to offer, and he'll probably have at least a dozen offers in the next two weeks, new offers. So I called the dad and told him that. He said, thanks for telling me. I believe we're going to hold off. Well, he committed to Ole Miss that night, <laughs> just hours after he told me that. I called him, and he said, look, we just couldn't take the risk because of the transfer. Yeah. One, the hands worth two in the bush, and that's – the philosophy, 
So that's where he ended up. So, um, and I think it's got a lot to do with the portal because, and, and it's hurt. There's no doubt. And, and there's been players in North Carolina that we've looked at and we've reported on. Sadiq White. I think you take the portal out, you go in years past. I really don't have a doubt that North Carolina would have offered Sadiq White. Uh, Jackson Keith, as he and I have had that conversation, that, you know, he said, I don't know if a, if a offer's coming or not because of the portal. I think you didn't have the portal, I'd probably get one by now. So I think you can, like I said, I think you can look at players at North Carolina in that now in the past would have gotten offers. And now it's, you know, it's a lot more gray area because you've got that portal to fall back on. And I, I think programs are successful can mix all three. They yeah. want a combination. They want an older team, but they want a combination of really good players out of high school, two or three a class. I think if you get more than three players per class out of high school, you're extending yourself. John Calipari ran into that, and he couldn't win in the tournament because his team was too young. He had too many freshmen. So he said it at Arkansas, I'm not doing anything. I'm only going to get a couple. Well, his class at Kentucky, before he left, he had seven coming in next year. And he had put himself behind the eight ball, and he could not get out from it because yeah. he had so many guys, freshmen coming in every year. Have a couple of those, have several guys that return, and then have transfer portal. And I've said this, I think Hubert Davis over the past year or two has had the perfect setup for the roster, not a roster build, but a roster because he said all of that in place. So the, there is a risk for kids, maybe not in the top 20, top 15, top 20 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a risk for the programs. And I think all the programs are now in a position where if they make a mistake, they could really screw themselves because we've seen the Kansas States of the world become players through NIL. And if you're going to, I could see schools like that raising the NIL package for some of these top high school players, DeBansa and some of those dudes, if it means suddenly a K-State being in play to get someone like that as opposed to Kentucky, just for the sake of discussion. Now, we've seen Hubert take a little bit of a cautious approach at times. Uh, hey, we'll take one of you three, first one that commits. Do you envision what we've seen based on the way Hubert's operated the last couple of years? He'll take his class – signed in November and move on and not even worry about recruiting any of the leftover kids in the spring to focus on the portal and maintaining his roster, which, by the way, a sidebar, people have been very critical of Hubert in the portal this year, but he maintained the roster. Yeah. And that that's a big part of it. you got to think of him main, keeping those kids on the roster, kind of like going out and getting kids of that caliber. Do you see Hubert maybe taking the, I'm going to get my guys in November, and that's pretty much it, that 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 approach moving forward? I think he'll just kind of balance it out the way he's been doing it. Why not? Like I said, I don't think he adds any more than about three guys. And then I think he uses the portal to, to – no, I wouldn't say patch the holes. That, that's kind of uh, – yeah, I think he does more than that to, to have really good fits. And you brought up a good point about the criticism uh, and, and the roster – maintaining the roster. And if he went the way the other ones went, I don't know they could maintain it. I yeah. think that he, Hubert Davis looks at this the way Nick Saban looked at it, the way Kirby Smart looked at it, the way I think Roy would have looked at it, uh, a, a lot of the Hall of Fame coaches. And that Rick Barnes did it at Tennessee with a player. Um, he is not going to just say, okay, I'll give you whatever you want to some guy that has never played there before, has never worn the jersey, has never been in a practice, has never sweat and bled for the program, and pay them more, or make, or I should say pay them, but they get more money than what the guys are already getting when I held it's been there. You talk about tearing a locker room apart. That is a big issue, a huge issue. And, you know, like I said, Kirby and Saban, if you go back and listen to them, that was their worry of NIL that it would just destroy the locker room. 
And you can't do that with guys coming in. Now, so let's look at North Carolina. North Carolina's NIL, if the NCAA, and they don't have the power to do it, but if the NCAA came back out and said, you know, everybody that's been doing this wrong and has been doing it as pay for play, which we said we wouldn't allow, which was the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I mean, what are you paying them? You're not paying them to go to chemistry class, right? I mean, that was <laughs> Just a horrible statement yeah. early on. My goodness. But anyway, if they went back and said, we're going to enforce that, North Carolina would be one of the few schools that they couldn't bust. Because North Carolina beforehand would have collected. They set things up where you're going to be paid there to advertise. You're going to be paid to promote, to market, those type of things. We saw – Armando and RJ, the different commercials and different restaurants and things like that. So that's kind of what happens. It's not a deal. It's like, hey, we need to, where you call, a, where I'm the head coach and I call one of my big boosters and say, hey, we really need to get this Andrew Jones guy, man. You've got to give me $2 million. And you Three do, bucks. that's what schools are doing. Okay. That's what a lot of them are doing. North Carolina is not doing that because one thing, they've already got all this set up with individuals. What what basically they're under contract once they come in. It's just not a handout. They're under contract. Yeah. But they know throughout the entire like collectives and all that, they know what the budget is. So the players yeah. come in, they can't hamstring the budget to bring in, to pay this guy, and then it takes away maybe from what they have next year. So, number one, they're tearing the locker room apart. Number two, they're, they're, they're destroying the budget. Okay? So, those things are important. So, I think before people look at it and say, okay, they should have paid $2 million to get this guy, what destructive impact would it have had on the roster of those guys coming back? You may not get R.J. Davis back. You may not get Elliot Cadeau back. You may not get those guys back yeah. if you do this. I, I and, and I could share this because it was said I, we, we put it on the board and we predicted where these guys would go before they did. But you mentioned Kansas State. Yeah. The, the, the money that went into NIL was originally there for Great Osable from Utah State, who ended up going with his coach from Utah State to Washington. That's what it was set up for. Kansas State yeah. was going to get – that's who they targeted one get it. Well, they didn't get it, and they got all this money put back. So now they've got – they're able to get the best players that are left because they have all of that. But, look, that's what they have to do. They don't have the roster construct, so I don't think to them it's a big a deal about keeping the locker room happy is what yeah. it is – Carolina because North Carolina is more a continuous program. Yeah, you know, there's a culture there. There's not really a culture at K State. They can define one maybe during the course of a year, but it's not a connected thing. And and that kind of goes back to the original point of this conversation and steering it toward North Carolina. I, I don't think I think the kid, the high school kids that wait to the spring are going to be a part of the bidding war. And I don't think North Carolina is going to get into a bidding war over high school kids. It, it, they're not really into doing it over college kids. So I can see, yeah. as we talked about originally, some kids are going to wait. But I think Hubert is going to be more inclined to get his class signed in November and then move forward and not even worry about recruiting that class anymore afterward. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, like I said, I think you do that and then you go get what you need in the portal. And you look, what did they need in the portal? They needed a, a yeah. wing who could a bigger wing that could score to kind of take Carmack Ryan, Boyd, you know, and they went and got Kay Tyson was the perfect fit. Now, you yeah. look at the post, they had to add a post player, and a lot of people say, well, we didn't get one, Ben Allen Lubin, not as big as what we wanted and all that, some people. But I still say, I think a lot of North Carolina fans need to understand that there's more than one way to skin a cat offensively and are kind of used to this yeah. old traditional playing two bigs, traditional four, back to the bucket five, and there's just not many schools that do that anymore. So you take that small ball, you take the Alabama, the Nate Oates approach, and, and, and some of the others do that where you spread the floor, you have a smaller five, you don't have a 
back to the bucket five. It, you, in other, instead of that, he's scoring out the ball screen roll. He's scoring out the dunker spot. He's rim running. I mean, you look at these guys in the NBA championships, neither team have got scores back to the bucket. They don't, I mean, you know, Dallas is just throwing it up to lively. He's either he's either on the fast break or he's he's getting it from the dunker spot or the screen the roll where he's throwing lobs to it. And I think, yeah. you know, like I said, I think Tyson Chandler started that. He uh he made five hundred million dollars as center and didn't have a post move. So, you know, he, he uh <laughs> and I think but that's that's where we're at now. But I'll tell you and I'll give you and I know we're off here, but it kind of goes with what we're saying. I coached Corey Brewer. I'm telling you where it first hit me. I coached Corey Brewer in AAU. So anytime Corey came around south and they were playing, my wife and I would go watch. He was playing with the Rockets. They had James Harden and they had Dwight Howard. So they went and played the Grizzlies in Memphis. We went to the game and I'm sitting in the players' family section. That was a pretty good deal, man, at the NBA game. So anyway, yeah. but it was more in a corner and you could really see stuff develop. So there's Harden. And you know kind of how he plays in isolation. Harden's either yeah. getting to the rim or shooting that pullback one, but that getting into the lane's a huge threat with James Harden. Well, there you've got Dwight Howard posting on the ball side block, just give it to me. So Harden can't go anywhere. And they know he can't go anywhere. As they start playing his outside shot. So when Howard goes out of the game, Harden just starts going off. And that's when he's getting his points. And I told my wife, I said, they may have the best center in the world. They're better off about it. He holds his offense back. So, I, and I'm not saying in any way Baycock did that. They, uh, we all wish Baycock was back for another year. But I think they yeah. can go to a more modern, small ball type of game where it's more open, you've got more lanes, you've got more open post, and, and I think they've got a roster to do that. We are going to have another conversation when we get into this. We're going to talk about the roster. Um, and we're going to sort of talk about what you're what you, what you're discussing right now. We're going to go a little bit more. Man, in I depth. took this conversation down. A, I took his conversation down a rabbit hole, didn't I? Well, that's good though. I, that's one of the things I love doing pods with you because we just let it rip, man. And and there's always a rabbit hole to go into with you, and it's always a fun place. We'll go into it a giant one, and I'm sure we'll tunnel a little bit from the giant one here in the next pod that we're going to do, which is not a daily drop. It's going to be more just specifically about the roster. This has been a daily drop. This is your first appearance on a daily drop in some time, so we need to do this more often. He's David Sisk. I'm AJ, and we very much appreciate you stopping by.